the party is really taking over how finance will be administered, regulated and supervised from the People's Bank of China and from the other regulators that people and investors may have been familiar with in the past. Hi, I'm Ed D'Agostino, and today I'm honored to be speaking with George Magnus, joining us from London. George is the former chief economist at UBS, and he's the author of the important book, Red Flags, Why Xi's China is in Jeopardy. Before we start, please take a quick second to subscribe to this channel. Thanks for joining me here at Global Macro Update. So George, I, I want to ask you all about U.S.-China relations and trade. But before we get into that, I watched a speech that you gave recently where you coined a phrase that really got my attention, deficit attention disorder. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Uh, what were you getting at? Because I think we suffer from that in the United States. To be honest with you, I can't remember the context in which I might have used that, but I, I've certainly used it in the context of the fiscal positions uh, of the U.S. and other developed countries that were, um, you know, expanding their their fiscal imbalances, obviously because of COVID. Um, but I've also used it in the context of China, um, because although the central government of Beijing, the Beijing central government actually has a reasonably, um, actually almost unremarkable uh, budgetary position. If you look at the kind of the wider concept of general government in China, which includes local and provincial governments and state enterprises and contingent liabilities of, you know, pension liabilities and what have you, um, China's public debt is uh, is also pretty big, actually. So, uh, so deficit dis d attention disorder really is really about... Um, well, what it says it is actually is the disorder um, that's potentially brought about, you know, when um, when when debt is running amok, actually. So it's not unique to the United States uh, no, and, and, no, and no. China is not averse to it either. No, no, it's all. In your book, Red, Red Flags, which which came out in 18, I think it was updated in 19. Um, and I want to get into some of the, what you wrote about here, because I think it's still so uh, uh, applicable today. But you wrote that that China is just as focused on disengaging as we are, disengaging being the term that they use uh, for, for separating or what we call decoupling. And I found that really interesting. Do, do you still feel that China is just as focused on it and, and that this isn't just a one-way street? Oh, most definitely. And in fact, China actually has been pursuing policies that we we would now call it decoupling. Um in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, they went by, you know, completely different names in China, but they were all part of an industrial policy that really changed, um, I mean, markedly changed in the late 2000s. Uh, so this is pre Xi Jinping um, and obviously pre the trade war that began uh, under the presidency of presidency of Donald Trump. Um, but China's, I mean, they originally they used to call it indigenous innovation, which was really about um, trying to promote national champions and um, uh, develop uh, uh, their own kind of capacities and what they now call self-reliance. Then in 2015, we have this famous policy called Made in China 2025, which doesn't really uh, crop up very much more anymore in kind of public uh, discussion because uh, uh, Beijing knows that it, it causes um, a, a lot of problems for uh, American and other politicians. But basically, this is a policy to establish dominant market shares of 70% or more in uh, a range of uh, modern industries at the frontier of science and technology, basically. Um, and this has been joined by lots of other documents and papers um, uh, articulating self-reliance and independence in uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, space, uh, ocean science, and so on and so forth. So China has been pursuing its own decoupling in a way in terms of trying to become less reliant on the United States and Japan and Korea and other countries. Um, semiconductors, obviously, now a biggie, uh, for, for quite some time. Um, I mean, the difference is, actually, 
China would like the Western world and the rest of the world to be dependent on it, but it doesn't want to be dependent on anybody else. So whether they can pull that off, of course, is a moot point um, because it may not be possible. But that is certainly the objective. So if that's the objective on both sides, West and East, where would you say we're at in terms of decoupling? Because what you mentioned is all, you know, sort of higher value, higher tech. But I think that there's, um, we're starting to see signs that that might be trickling down in the economy. Maersk, for example, recently announced that they're permanently laying off 10% of their workforce, going from 100,000 employees to Mm 90,000. And it's not a a short-term fix. The the CEO came out saying he's right-sizing the company for the new environment of trade, global trade that we're in. Yeah, and as I'm sure that uh, listeners will know, I mean, um, the word decoupling is now deemed to be a little bit too rude, right? So the the word de-risking is now the kind of fashionable term, um, which was, I think, first used by Ursula van der Leyen, the uh, president of the EU Commission. But it's now been embraced by uh, Janet Yellen and by um, Gina Raimondo and, and other kind of senior US politicians uh, and everybody else. And basically, I mean, I don't really see much difference, really. I think the way to think about this is whether you want to call it decoupling or de-risking, it's a process. You know, there's at one extreme, you've got uh, total engagement, which is like what we had 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. At the other extreme, you've got complete separation of, um, you know, engagement altogether. And um, obviously, we are at neither of those extremes now. Um, and over time, we may fluctuate somewhere on that continuum to be more or less decoupled or de risk But the trend, I think, if we look at what's going on in terms of the policies of actual companies, I mean, the governments, obviously, Chinese government, American government, European governments, I mean, are taking various measures to try to insulate themselves and protect themselves under the umbrella of national security and all of the things that that means nowadays. But companies themselves are basically um, moving, you know, supply chains, investment, foreign direct investment. These things are starting to change already. So it's estimated, for example, that in in China, if you look at the kind of surveys of the American Chamber of Commerce and the EU Chamber of Commerce, about 20 to 25 percent of firms either have or on the process of considering moving future investment outside of the PRC uh, to places like Mexico or to Malaysia or um, uh, Japan, Korea, um, Central and Eastern Europe, and so on. And I think, you know, if you're selling Gucci handbags to the Chinese middle class, you're on nobody's radar screen. It really doesn't really matter. Um, But if you're doing stuff which is really you know, much more closely related to um, semiconductors or advanced technology or um, anything that might have what the Chinese, uh, what is called um, sort of civic military fusion. In other words, things that are ostensibly for civilian use, but actually could be uh, requisitioned um, for military purposes. Um, These kinds of things are really uh, a no-no. And you've got to be very careful not to be in the crosshairs of the legislation and the uh, shareholder um, uh, you know, demands that exist in your home country and your host country. So these are things which are impacting corporate behavior now. So you do think that there will be sort of a, a value level below which trade still does happen between East and West? Yes. I mean, the degree of integration between um, uh, China and the rest of the world. I mean, China is about a third of global manufacturing value added. You you can't just kind of extinguish that or just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and, and a lot of companies, you know, still bigger companies still see merit in being in China uh, for the long term, they think, because of the size of the market. I mean, that's the kind of traditional reason. Um, And at the same time, of course, China is still pretty central to supply chains. Um, And uh, of course, that is now a battleground. So when uh, President Biden's administration um, introduced, uh, or when, I wouldn't say, sorry, not, when Congress actually should say passed the Inflation Reduction Act and um, uh, the Chips and Science Act, um, then, you know, what we 
basically there are lots of kind of provisions, obviously, in those acts. But what they have, at least in part, the objective of changing the geography of supply chains in the next 10 years. And, um, and so these things will happen. And we see that already in, for example, bilateral US-China trade, because more and more trade is being relocated to Mexico, for example, not just by American companies, but by Chinese companies, too. So Mexico is obviously a winner. I think Vietnam has, has been a winner of this trend. I'm curious, do you think that there are countries, and I've got India in mind in, in particular, countries that can play both sides, which I think is going to become v- really difficult, but c- can a country like India benefit from this trend because they seem to be able to maintain decent relationships with both East and West? So this is kind of a the the kind of the the, the other side really of the uh, you know throw up your hands in horror deglobalization you know, kind of discussion is that you know that that obviously is a problem because it it's a, it's a less efficient option from the one that we developed in the last twenty or thirty years it's more costly to recalibrate supply chains so prices may be permanently higher etc cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, there are a number of countries. Now we've talked; you've mentioned Vietnam and India, um, but I mean there are many others in Asia, Central Europe, and, and even elsewhere um, that could be beneficiaries of new investment um, by uh, large Western companies, or you know Japanese, Australian companies, and what have you. Um, now these numbers may not uh, kind of rock China because China's a 19 trillion dollar economy but in much much smaller economies the influx of new investment and new production facilities can make a huge difference um to investors uh, and to the countries themselves of course you mentioned investment we recently heard that for the first time in decades foreign investment in China has actually gone negative like Money's coming out. I'm curious what you think the reasons for that are. Do you, do you think that that is a signal um, or a response to economic weakness in China? Or do you think that is more of a reset on the part of investors feeling like China's just not as investable as it once was? Just to contextualize, I mean, this negative number comes after about five quarters um, during which um, – the net inflows of direct investment have been declining pretty sharply. So whether we actually continue to see net outflows of foreign direct investment on a quarterly basis, very, very difficult to judge. But I think the environment has changed. And um, and I think part of that is due to just geopolitical uh, developments and the some of the kind of feisty relationships and decoupling and export controls and what have you that we've been uh, talking about. Some of it, I think, also is very much due to Xi Jinping's government, um, which has certainly um, not done itself any favours, notwithstanding the fact that they talk uh, a very soft rhetoric about welcoming foreign firms and they want new capital to come to China. But actually, in practice, what they do in terms of legislation, like the anti-espionage law that was passed recently, uh, data privacy and data transfer legislation, cybersecurity legislation, um, uh, tit-for-tat controls against American companies, um, either in response to or as a consequence of um, just uh, difficult relationships with Washington, for example, um, I mean, the business environment in China is <clears throat> not what it used to be. And my sense, uh, just talking to many number of companies in China over the years, is that whilst many companies were prepared to put up with the idiosyncrasies of working in China uh, under the Communist Party rule during the last you know, 10 to 20 years, um, those idiosyncrasies have become much more troublesome now. Um, because they're more politicized. And in fact, everything is politics in China. You know, Xi Jinping says the party leads everything, which is in in the economy, in commerce, in society, in life. Um, The party takes the lead, private enterprise, private firms, entrepreneurs um, take a kind of play second fiddle um, and have to toe the party line, really. Uh, So the business environment has changed. Uh, The geopolitics are much more feisty. Companies, rightly, I think, are starting to fret more about 
being in these dangerous crosshairs where they may have to choose between, you know, whose laws to follow and whose laws to flout. And that's um, that's not what companies go into business to do. They want to be able to manage risk, not to be able not to become bombarded by it um, um, unilaterally by either the Chinese or, or American governments or anybody else. How do you see this all playing out in Europe for European companies? Um, what, what, what does the trade alignment look like from, from your part of the world? Yeah, so I think um, notwithstanding some of the frosty relations that have existed between um, Beijing and Washington, obviously these are kind of a uh, little bit softer now because we're, we see, as we speak, you know, we're awaiting confirmation or otherwise whether Xi Jinping will go and meet um, Joe Biden at the APEC meeting in San Francisco. Um, but uh, with Europe, it's a little bit different. So the, the Europeans, generally speaking, are not quite as uh, kind of um, not quite as aggressive or insistent, shall we say, at least from a political point of view, about um, closing China out. Although they certainly have been more vigilant about direct investment from Chinese companies coming into Europe, um, particularly in areas of high technology or where national security uh, might be involved. And uh, by the same token, you know, China has a huge surplus with Europe um, and requires or, you know, really depends, I think, in some respects on being able to export pretty much open door to to Europe. And the Europeans are now smarting under threat, as they perceive it, of um, uh, damage to one of the main industries, the automobile industry, uh, from Chinese electric vehicles and Chinese battery manufacturers. Um, and so there are, you know, the Commission in Europe and other uh, countries bilaterally are kind of looking at the prospects of uh, imposing restrictions on China's access. So it's, it's, a, it's also a feisty relationship, not as feisty as it is with the U.S., um, for obvious reasons, um, it's not as involved in, in China as, I mean, politically as, as the United States is. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there is a sort of a, there is a harmony, if you want to put it that way, notwithstanding the fact that the United States and Europeans do have uh, commercial and trade issues that they, they argue about. But there is a harmony there, at least in terms of their attitude towards kind of China, I think. China doesn't get along well with uh, a lot of its more immediate neighbors as well. Uh, I'm thinking about Japan in particular. What uh, what impact does all of this have on Japan? Can Japan capitalize on some of this change, or are they so far down the demographic curve that they can't really add much more to their economy? Japan, I mean, it it has been dealing with its uh, its you know rapid aging problem for longer than anybody else, um, just because the you know baby boomers came in to Japan, you know, several years before they came to, to Western Europe and, and to the United States. So it's been a bit sort of longer in the tooth. Um, and um, Japan's big problem was that after the bust in the 1990s, um, they just prevaricated just for too long. Um, I mean, politically, it was very difficult, um, but they had to wait until Prime Minister Abe um, before they were really able to start um, introducing reform. And I think that um, in some respects, Japan hasn't done, since that started, hasn't done too badly. Um, they've certainly introduced um, uh, measures and incentives for Japanese companies to come back from Japan, from China, I should say, to to Japan. And, um, you know, clearly they, you know, they're part of kind of Asia Pacific uh, trade agreements. They, you know, want to participate. They want to. They've still got, you know, very important things to say and do in terms of global manufacturing. Um, obviously, it's not the country that we feared it might be, you know, or thought it might be in 1980 or 1985. Uh, but they're still pretty important. And actually, if you think about what Japan does in the, you know, technology space, um, I mean, its automobile factor, uh, manufacturers are now looking at solid state batteries, which may be the next thing that will happen after lithium batteries. Um, uh, they're very keen on sort of climate change mitigation technology, um, very big in this kind of semiconductor space. So, yeah, I mean, I think they still have um, pretty big, pretty big role to play in the Asian economy and global economy. Yeah. So we can't talk about China without without talking about geopolitics a little bit more directly, um, specifically with regard to Taiwan. I know you're an economist. 
But what are your thoughts in and around the rhetoric that seems to be building around Taiwan? There, there, are, there are not insignificant corners of Twitter, now X, where you read fairly credible people talking about how we need to be preparing for a war uh, over Taiwan, uh, which it, to me is kind of mind blowing. I'm, I'm really curious what your thoughts are and if you think that the situation is truly that dire. Yeah. Well, I'm not scared off by, by the labeling of being an economist. I think if you're an economist looking at China, you cannot but look at the politics. I mean, actually, that's probably true for every country nowadays. But in particular for China, I mean, political economy is everything. And my kind of view about this really is that the Communist Party craves stability above all else. In fact, many of the policy errors that they've made, um, you know, not just during zero COVID, but before then and subsequently, are really down to this kind of fear of change. And they, uh, as I said, the, the, the craving for stability drives them to do things which are sometimes um, policies which actually are not very much in their interests. Having said that, um, what where that leads really is that if, and my judgment is, for what it's worth, um, is that if logic, you know, counts for anything, then the Beijing will continue to harass and bully Taiwan and you know continue to sound off and send you know you know naval patrols and aircraft and so on and so forth. But actually it's not in its interest basically to incur the wrath of the United States um, in terms of extreme sanctions such as those imposed on Russia um, or indeed to uh, you know even, deign to move towards a blockade of of Taiwan because, um, you know, the U.S. fleet in the Pacific, you know, could do exactly the same to Chinese ports. So the economic consequences for China of, uh, you know, risking an escalation, serious escalation uh, that might get people, I mean, seriously worried about um, about blockade or, or invasion, I think would be uh, extraordinarily damaging. And um, and China's economy is not in the best of shape uh, anyway. So um, so I think that that fear of what that might do to the politics of China and to political stability, I think will keep them. I think it'll keep them sober. Right. Having said that, you know, we're all human and uh, logic doesn't always prevail. People sometimes do irrational things. And and one of the questions that often gets asked really is whether, you know, a more volatile and unstable China is more of a risk than a strong China. I'm not sure that's a great question to answer, to be honest, because if China was kind of confident and strident and, you know, pushing enemies and adversaries away very easily, then we'd all be very fearful about what they would intend. And obviously, if things are not that way in China, which I don't think they are, um, then we can't, you know, there's no accounting for what might happen to, um, you know, decisions that might be reached for all sorts of um, curious and irrational reasons. So I just think, you know, we have to be obviously, you know, alert, um, aware. I mean, as investors, I don't think you can possibly discount it because, you know, something dramatic might happen in a month and we wouldn't see it or it might not happen at all or maybe in you know years to come so you can't really position yourself as an investor for unpredictability of that nature um, but we have to be but politically and diplomatically we have to be alert and aware and also know more about china's strengths and weaknesses and how that might influence its politicians and that's something obviously one imagines our intelligence people should be good at hopefully well you mentioned that China's economy is having some trouble, and in uh, in red flags, in your book you wrote about in in the in the paperback version. By the way, I only have one criticism of this book, and that it's the font is so small. <laughs> I need cheaters on top of cheaters, <laughs> but that but that's an aside. Oh my God. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a fantastic book, and in the in the afterword, which you added, I believe, in two thousand nineteen, you talk about how. Uh, People just assume, like, like financial media just takes it for granted that China's economy will soon be the largest in the world. 
And you take issue with that. And I found that really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why you think that might not be inevitable? So just a couple of points about that. I mean, of course, even if it were to happen that China's economy would surpass that of the US, in income per head terms, um, China's kind of relative position would still be a fraction of the US. Um, so you'd have to, you know, extend your spreadsheet out, you know, I don't know, to the end of the century or something before you'd actually get any kind of closure. But that's really just an exercise in doing straight lines on spreadsheets. And, and the world isn't really like that. Um, so the second point is, uh, the main thing about whose economy is bigger in terms of GDP is really about bragging rights. It, it doesn't really convey anything more significant than, you know, somebody being able to strut like a peacock or, you know, or just kind of say, you know, you can't catch us or we've just caught you or whatever that happens to be. I don't really think it's that important. Um, and the third thing is that it might never happen because not only is China's economic growth in nominal terms, so we, we, we normally measure countries' GDP in kind of market terms of U.S. dollars. Some people do it according to a kind of a theorem, um, which is called purchasing power parity, according to which China's economy is already bigger than the United States. But in my judgment, that's a, that's a better mechanism for measuring individual welfare rather than national prosperity or national welfare. So let's just stick to the uh, market dollar terms for the time being. And I think that <clears throat> the reason that I think that it might never happen or might happen momentarily and then reverse is because um, China's nominal growth is really low. Um, so the economy probably isn't going to grow by more than about two or three percent potentially per annum for the foreseeable future. I mean, there'll be some higher years and some lower. Uh, inflation is really low in China. Um, I mean, almost absent because demand is so uh, weak in China. So the nominal increase in China's GDP is probably going to be either the same as or less than it is likely to be in the United States. So for that mathematical reason alone, um, it's likely, in my judgment, that um, that this is going to be like a mirage, this kind of il sorpasso, as the Italians used to call it, uh, about overtaking um, the United Kingdom uh, many, many years ago. So this surpassing of America's GDP, you know, could be just like a, a, a moving finger on the wall. You know, it just does never actually arrives. From an investor's point of view, George, not a not a corporation, but. Uh, uh, that needs to put capital to work, but but just a, an investor. Do you think China is investable at, at this point? Good question. And a lot of investment banks have asked that question during 2023. I mean, from a technical point of view, uh, you know, I think the answer is yes, right? You can, you know, the, the bid offer spreads aren't outrageous. The liquidity is plentiful. People's Bank of China is constantly uh, making good liquidity shortfalls. Market liquidity is, generally speaking, okay. Um, if you want kind of new things to do in China, if you're a little bit kind of wary about the Chinese housing market and about the Chinese middle class, Xi Jinping is prioritizing all the time what he calls as new productive forces, which are these industries at the cutting edge of science and technology. They're putting a lot of money into these firms and industries, mostly state enterprises. But, you know, th there are things that you can do in China and there are companies that you can buy that have strong exposure to those areas and those sectors, um, which, uh, <clears throat> which are investable. Yes. The, the question, though, is also, you know, has, has got a, it's a double edged sword because because of the legislation and the due diligence problems that I alluded to when we were talking about legislation in China, because of the campaign that is um, underway all the time in which foreign business people or the employees in China of foreign firms and or um, uh, companies, well, I mean, Micron Technologies and, you know, um, Mints and other companies have been um, targeted. Some have kind of decided to kind of slim down their presence in China or pull out. Um, so this business environment actually uh, means that, and, and the governance system that has 
taken root in China are that these are things which actually make investment much less attractive because you you can't get the information that you think you might need, maybe about a company's management or about a company's the party involvement in a company. Documents may be prevented. Some companies, some people have had data access restricted. Um, so just the kind of the due diligence process that portfolio investors need to go through and the confidence they need to have to buy um, China mainland shares, um, I mean, these are just much more complicated now. And there's a huge question mark over if you want exposure to China, whether you should or if you want it and need it for one reason or another, benchmark purposes and so on, maybe there are just different ways of accumulating that exposure. Um, so it is problematic. It's much more problematic than I think any of us can remember. And uh, the last thing I would say is, you know, the, the, you know, and I would kind of hand on heart have to say that I was kind of part of that process as well. But the um, the kind of mantra that actually a lot of banks used to sing about, you know, you're underweight China because one day, you know, you're going to have to have 15, 20, 25 percent uh, portfolio weighting in China. I mean, that's just not going to happen. I mean, most people have, if they have portfolio weightings to China at all, on average, I would say in pension funds and a lot of big asset managers, it's probably about five to 10 percent. Um, and I just think that's the peak. George, I, I could ask you an hour's worth of more questions. I don't want to subject you to that. Is there anything that I should have asked you that you is, is, is on your mind that you would want to that you would want to talk about? I think one of the things that um, I've just been kind of drawn to recently, which may be of, of interest to um, to people, is is what's been happening in the finance sector in China, where a brand new financial architecture has just kind of taken hold. It was foreshadowed at the National People's Congress in the spring. Um, and the first meeting of the Central Financial Work Conference has just concluded, it used to be called the National Work Conference. Now it's the Central. And basically what uh, people, again, are having to have to come to terms with is the, the notion that actually that the party which believes that finance is the lifeblood of the economy, that's a quote from the recent uh, readout of the meeting, um, but uh, the party is really taking over how finance will be administered, regulated and supervised uh, from the People's Bank of China and from the other regulators that people and investors may have been familiar with in the past. So this has got kind of many advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages of centralizing political control over the financial sector is you might be able to eradicate the kind of silo mentality um, and um, uh, regulatory arbitrage that other financial systems um, sometimes experience, which make them ineffective. The disadvantage, the big disadvantage is when you have politics in command, which is effectively what is going on here, is that everybody's balance sheet is going to be tipping the same way. So they just need one error in policy and they could compound um, a financial crisis that otherwise might needn't, needn't have happened. So um, I think people need to watch um, how this centralized financial uh, supervision system actually works in practice. Just to make sure everyone understands, would this, would this be sort of the equivalent of Congress taking over the Federal Reserve in the U.S.? Pretty much, or maybe one of the parties, right? So, or, you know, whichever party had the majority in the Congress would basically, yes, effectively, yes, it would take over the responsibilities of, not take, o not take over the administration that the Federal Reserve and the Securities and Exchange Commission and other regulators um, do, but actually would determine the political direction in which that regulation would take place. Just, yeah. Crazy thought when you think about it. That's, that's, what could go wrong? Exactly. That's really what's going on in China. Now, they do this, obviously, because they think they don't think about regulation the same way that we do. Um, and they think that um, having this, the party in control of regulation is the way to minimize volatility and create uh, order and um, contribute to what they call the orderly accumulation of capital. Um that's obviously just the party's view. Was the People's Bank of China ever 
truly independent? What is the scale of this shift? No. Uh, well, it's a big shift. I mean, the, the People's Bank of China was always a body of the state council, which is like the sort of cabinet, really. Um, and so it never, was never really independent in the way that the Federal Reserve is. Um, but uh, for many years, a long time, actually, I mean, I think there was a genuine and real confidence in the ability and willingness of the People's Bank of China to carve out a little kind of niche for itself, because it was, for the most part, staffed by, at senior level, staffed by people that were more reformist and liberally minded in terms of um, how finance operated, economic direction. Um, sometimes the finance people would kind of blaze a trail, really, in terms of deregulation and liberalization. And if it worked, you know, then the implications would be that this would spread to other bits of the economy as well. Um, but now the PBC, People's Bank of China, has pretty much been stripped of uh, anything like that. And it, it's an administrator of the work of the Central Financial Commission, which determines the political direction of monetary policy, financial policy and regulation. You can learn more about the U.S.'s efforts to de-risk by checking out this mini documentary.